So we're here with Mairead Maeve, who is participating in the ISLA Festival here at the Instituto Cervantes in Dublin. Welcome. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Great to have you here. So um, first of all, I just want to ask, do you have any Spanish language connections that kind of drew you into the festival? Well, no, I believe I was. it was uh, Jean-Philippe Ander who... Um, recommended me because I suppose of the performance thing I'm not sure really um, but um, I don't exactly I don't have a Spanish connection except that I have been involved in translating a couple of poems Galician poems but apart from that none no. wonderful and um, so earlier during the session that you were involved in which was the crossing frontiers um, session on poetry in the suitcase you were making the case for poetry being experimental and not boring. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you try to, you know, make your poetry experimental and make it something that people are excited to read? I know you do performance poetry as well, so that's... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started off by publishing a collection, but my poetic philosophy from the beginning was to write poems that mirrored the sense, in other words, that formally represented the experience. That's the oldest rule in the book, I suppose, except that I suppose most contemporary poets don't do it. Uh, so uh, I decided that 20 years ago and I haven't found a better rule and I need to know where I'm going. I, I need to have a plan with whatever I write and I've written prose as well. I need to have some sort of a philosophy or plan, a core notion and that's always been my core notion. Um, I've been interested in drama, I've done acting and, and trained in, in you know voice and, and movement so I suppose that's I did that because I was interested in being other people, being other personalities um, so my poetry um, predictably followed the same sort of impulse. Um, I like to explore different personalities and different feelings and it seems the thing to do for me to try and mirror that in the form. And then when I present the poem, I try and reflect the experience in how I'm presenting it. So I want to live the experience again. It's it's a physical thing. And um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm very interested in new theories of um, the embodied mind, uh, the old uh, Cartesian theory. It, it's fast fading now, but it's influenced us for hundreds of years. That is, that there's a separation between the mind and the body. I've never felt that separation, and now I'm being vindicated by theories that agree with me. <laughs> Neuroscientific and, and philosophical and linguistic theories that are um, propounding this uh, notion of the mind and the body all being one. We can't really separate one from the other. That um, we have some embedded metaphors uh, that produce themselves without our without our even thinking about them. So that's really where where I'm at with the poetry and um, why I'm doing it. And it's becoming deeper because of this new research and because of these new ideas. I now um, feel it, it's a it's a philosophy. So it's a poetry that encompasses the whole self. It's not yeah. a separate. Yeah, not a separation between the mind and body. No, because actually um, meaning and sound have always been intertwined for me. I've always felt guilty about that because um, I find it hard to listen to somebody if their voice is creating um, certain reactions or responses in the body. And I've always felt that I was a bit of a, uh, whatever, uh, a churlish over that because people go away and say, wasn't that wonderful what he said? And I didn't hear a word of it because his voice, I couldn't listen to his voice. <laughs> Not just the content, but the presentation yeah. as well. Yeah, so me. for me, in a sense it is. Texts, I will I will pour over texts sometimes if I don't like the style. Um, but it's all, it all seems to be the one for me, the style and the, and the, the thinking. You very know? intertwined. Yeah, it's all very intertwined. You were saying earlier that you've done some translations. Are there certain things that you find are expressed better in a different language than English? Oh, well, I've just worked with a Galician um, and actually the last couple of translations were in the, this particular writer writes in both Galician and Spanish. When I approached the text, the Galician text first, I went, oh my good grief, how am I going to represent these sounds, these vowels and these S's in English? Because, you know, the broadness of it and even the look of the words on the page, I knew that the equivalent words in English, um, if I took, say, the instantly equivalent words in English, um, I'd be, it felt that I would be applying 
steel to velvet, right? And I said, I, I, I'm going to have to, you know, work with this. So I did talk to um, somebody from Galicia who read the poems for me, taught me something of how she was feeling. And I could see, I could see the effect the words were having in her body. For example, there was one word, immenso. So for me, if I say immense, I go immense. Uh, I see white, right? She said immenso. And I could see red tingle tinged with uh, dark blue and black and she took it right down into her stomach and I'm oh that's different you know this immense so she's she's containing it so um I I would say certainly that's just I'm not sure because I don't know the Spanish language well enough but in Irish there are certain words um that I um there are certain expressions in Irish that I cannot translate into English and that constantly come up in my mind. Nyather is one of them. Um, that's just a throwaway. I don't know. Nyather. I mean, it just sounds excellent. And there are other words that just come to mind in Irish that there is no equivalent. Um, I suppose that's because um, the form of thinking um, and the language is connected. So, And uh, cultural experience, national experience... You know, we're pretty much the same human beings all over, but certain experiences, um, I suppose, have been expressed in certain words and therefore don't translate. Yeah, definitely. So your language would obviously then encompass this whole cultural experience as well, and your mm -hmm. language is going to reflect that. So what you're saying is if you're coming from a different culture, a different language, you might not have that same intrinsic connection to certain words. I would say so, yes. That's why translation must be very difficult. Well, I loved translating and I did find it difficult, but a fantastic experience because I love the empathising. And it's really for the other writer you're doing it and for um, the sharing um, by proxy in a sense. Although when you're sharing somebody's work, entering into somebody's work in a way, you're entering into something that's extraordinarily intimate. So without meeting the body, you are you're entering into a sort of empathic relationship with somebody and that's that's really quite a privilege uh, it's really great yeah and it must be tried upon very carefully I'm sure there's yeah, yeah you'd want to be you have to be careful so when I was doing that I was constantly referring back to at least a medium you know the the editor um who would then you know perhaps talk to the poet uh but as well as that with the with the translation it's interesting because you do feel I do feel that if I'm approaching if I'm going to do a version of a text, I have to have enough freedom to reproduce it um, in my own cultural terms and in my own personal perceptive terms as well. So um, whereas the author might expect a certain translation from their knowledge of, say, English, um, they're not always right to do that. I mean, because it's a relationship. Right. So you bring along your yeah. cultural experiences. And my personal experiences and my, you know, my own hopes, say, for the text. So that there's a response. It's a... It's a it's a call and response. It seems very collaborative. Like you might yeah. think of translation as, you know, kind of a, a one-sided um, experience, but it sounds very collaborative from what you're saying. Well, I would, that's the way I'd approach it. There are a whole lot of different ways of approaching it, but I'd certainly like to reproduce um, as far as possible the intent of the author. So with that first poem, those first poems I did, I took a lot of care to try and reproduce the sounds. So I would have changed the phraseology, I would have um, maybe said things that the original author didn't exactly say, but in order to give um, that taste of the poem, like it, it's like imitating a fruit, really. <laughs> so you want to produce another fruit that's so similar that, that you know, that, that somebody say, oh, well, they're of the same family, you know? Yeah. So um, trying to turn the lines where they turn the lines, but also trying to reproduce that, just the taste, yeah, as well. Great. Um, can you tell us a bit about, I know you're going to be doing a reading tomorrow. Yeah. Are you going to be doing performance poetry? Well, I'm going to be reciting, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Can you tell us a bit about the piece or have you not picked the piece yet? Or Yeah, I've, so, I've several pieces and the pieces I chose, um, I chose them because of the topic we were discussing today. They're about change and um, transition and travel, basically from country to city. Um, but having listened to everything today, I may change I mean there's one poem I feel I, I might do so I might be dropping a few poems and, and doing this one instead this one called Inish which is about um uh home sense of home and language and of course the word Inish in Ireland means um our island and it also uh is the verb to tell which is kind of interesting it's the noun island and it's the verb to tell
Uh, so it's about it's about that sort of language. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, and we look forward to hearing from you tomorrow. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.